really since kind of the YouTube channel picked up a little bit, mm -hmm. a few people have have decided they wanted to talk to me and have found that I'm much less interesting in real life than in. <laughs> I don't know about interesting, but I find you hilarious. Um, and, and to me, that's more important than interesting. Okay. Um, is, <laughs> I'm happy to be here with Jameson Nathan Jones. You know his channel. You know his work and his compositions and all the crazy and wild things he does. We're going to talk about all of that today and in several different types of, uh, of ways. But the first thing I want to talk about is what something I call the income variance. And uh, I see you as someone who probably like me has to deal with a lot of music incomes. And it's really the first question I always ask everybody, how do you make music income? Well, it has evolved as you can imagine over the years. Um, I was actually thinking about it the other day and I've been incredibly blessed um, in that I have never had a job that wasn't music related in some way. Wow. Now that's a little different because I came from the classical world. So, mm -hmm. you know, inherent to that was, uh, being a pianist first, um, a lot of accompanying gigs and things like that. So it, it was a lot of work. Um, but I've always been able to do something music related. Um, and of course I started piano at like eight years old. So it's been like a life, a lifetime mm -hmm. thing. Um, and then also as I started studying organ at around uh, 15, um, church work became a big part of what I do. And that's still my full-time gig. I'm still a, a church organist, director of music, direct the choir. We're going to talk uh, about that. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that that has been the longest through line of income for me. Is that more traditional? background, like, you know, in the real world <laughs> of doing mm -hmm. stuff, you know, playing yeah. uh, for people. Um, and then recently in the last, uh, I don't know, coming up on eight years now, I decided I wanted to start releasing my own music. And that kind of opened up this kind of world where you and I both inhabit now. Yeah. Uh, it is kind of a strange new world uh, yeah. still for me um, of trying to get my music heard. And, and I've had I've had some success, you know, I'm not uh, a worldwide name or anything, but I've had some success in streaming and things like that in the past, um, which took me from, you know, making zero dollars in that world for a long time to all of a sudden making a few hundred each month, you know, from from streaming and, and Bandcamp and all of those things. So Bandcamp, who's your distributor? Uh, distributor, I, I was doing it all myself. Uh, so early on, it was DistroKid. Yeah. Um, and then I switched to symphonic, uh, a couple years ago. Explain the switch to symphonic. That's interesting. Um, they're a smaller company. They're a bit more mm -hmm. selective in who they take on. And I, I like the fact that I can get in touch with them if I need to. DistroKid is kind of, there are so many people that use that platform and it's great to get started and it's and affordable and fast. Yeah. Um, but, but if you ever have a problem, it's kind of hard to actually get anyone's attention at district. It just, I guess the sheer volume that they deal with. So it feels a bit more personal at symphonic and, and the people that operated are musicians too. So they kind of, they understand, you know, so, yeah. but you mm -hmm. have to kind of set your expectations when you do something like that, that the reach is not going to be quite the same as like a felt piano, peaceful piano thing. You know, those just have more places to go to be totally honest. I'm not. I'm not as focused on the streaming side as I was since the YouTube channel and everything has kind of mm -hmm. taken off a bit yeah. more because I don't feel like I have to be, right. if that makes sense. You don't so feel that like was your artist of, side has to, has to uh, support you, basically, is what you're saying. Well, yeah, there's that. And also, and we'll, I don't want to get too far off track of, of your question, but but the way I've approached the YouTube channel has allowed me to kind of keep the focus on my music. So I don't yep. feel like I need playlist placements gotcha. to get my music out there. There are other vehicles, you know, so. It's probably a good thing because they're very, very hard to get now. And I think the they whole um, Spotify for artists thing is less about getting on a playlist, most likely, and more about getting on release radar, probably, yes. if you want to get into the weeds with Spotify there. Yep, um, totally. All right. Your main income is still at the church as the organist of a church, right? Yes. Is this a big church? Um, it's a pretty good size. Like the 
Are we talking building or people that go there? <laughs> I guess I <laughs> the building either. is pretty good. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the attendance ship, uh, never quite came back after COVID, you know, yeah. as, as I think is the case for everyone. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a good size organ. Uh, it's one that I've used in, in several recordings and stuff. I try to use it in, in kind of experimental and creative ways in my own music. Um, full pipe organ or is it? Yeah. A, yeah. Know. Full pipe organ four manual, about. 5,000 pipes somewhere around there wow. tucked away all enclosed in the walls, which we, I won't nerd out too much about the organ side, but it's fully well, expressive. So yeah, it's we'll get really back nice. to that. Um, so besides that, you've got your channel, would that be your second and in biggest income at these days as it, as it's growing? Well, <clears throat> it actually last year was the biggest, mm -hmm. um, yeah, towards Congrats. the end of the year, because I, uh, sort of transitioned to more educational stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And off the back of that, I was able to build out a couple of courses. Uh, one yeah, in particular right. is kind of about composition and my philosophies on composition. And yeah. that that course alone um, out earned my church income, which was kind of mind blowing to me and kind of opened my eyes to the possibilities. So that's why a lot more of my energy is going into the channel these days than, <laughs> right. uh, than, than other things. But, uh, you know, it's important to me, though, as we just mentioned, to keep the focus on my music. Like, I don't want to just start making whatever I think is going to work well right. for YouTube. Right. I want to keep I want to keep it focused so that it's always centered around, like, the stuff right. that I want to be making. So the church income and your channel income, do you, any other incomes besides we've talked about, you know, anything you might make from royalties of any kind, including sales and things like that. Any other music incomes that we should talk about? Yeah. There's a little bit of licensing in there of just, yeah. um, you know, like with the art list stuff, um, which I'm currently trying to figure out what to do with my catalog. Um, that also I'm, I'm is not, something we'll talk about in a yeah, little while. Yeah. And, and that, that would be a good thing to talk about because I'm kind of in a in limbo of like, what should I do with all sure. this stuff? You know, let's, let's move into your music background. When did you start playing music? When did this start? Started piano at eight. Um, and of course I was playing around, you know, when I would pass by a piano, I would, you know, tinker on it and stuff like that. So I yeah. was showing interest before then I used to play. I remember there's incriminating uh, video evidence somewhere of me playing roundabout or playing along with on the piano as my dad's was playing roundabout on yeah, you know by yes the record player yeah mm -hmm. yeah so yeah that's floating around out there it will never see the internet <laughs> i hope but so yeah i was very interested both my parents are musicians um my dad was a high school choir director and has always done church music and everything mm -hmm. um and my mom went to uh, has a has a degree as well in uh, choral conducting, music education. Wow. So um, yeah, I was kind of I didn't have a chance really. Is what I'm trying to say. I, Did you always good. just know it was your thing that was just going to be probably? I mean, when I, I'm saying grow up in a music family where mm -hmm. music is just what you kind of do, and so. Uh, did you just always know that likely music would be your thing? I mean, yeah, I, I think I had a pretty good feeling early on um, because I had a natural sort of inclination to it and was therefore had the benefit that not everyone has of my parents being very supportive of it and right. encouraging it. Um, so I, I fully recognize that not everyone has that experience mm -hmm. and it was very important. Yeah, so I guess the the positive feedback and kind of gratification that I got from it early on kind of uh, hastened me along in that direction. Um, and then when I started taking piano lessons, it was clear pretty early that I had sort of a natural affinity for it. So I kind of, from that point, it it never seemed like I would do anything else, you know? Um, yeah, right. So, yeah. There's a time that you realize this is the thing that either I do better than everyone else or as good as anyone else and yeah. is my passion. And yeah. I think that happens for some reason that seems to happen right around 13, 14. It seems like you, when you're getting into middle school and you realize I'm never going to play football or basketball like other people do, you know, there are things that you could do science and all this other stuff. And you realize, Oh, you know what? 
I'm going to be a music person. That's just what I, that's what's always floating around in here. It's what I want to go yep. home and do when I'm done with school. All right. So let's talk about education. Uh, you talked about starting piano lessons when you were eight. Uh, I also did, I just didn't stay with them. My mother was a piano yep. teacher. And so she tried to teach me that didn't take because, um, I was just too interested in what I was hearing versus what I wanted, what she wanted me to read. If that makes sense. How did you, yep. how did you accept the reading? Because that's what it takes to take piano lessons successfully as a kid, I think. Yeah, well, that's and that's an interesting thing that that I get asked quite a bit is a lot of people say, "Well, I started piano, but I hated all of the music that I, I was being taught." You know, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know if I was just. I think I probably was having success at it and i i didn't i wanted to like i'm a i'm a naturally a non-confrontational person um and i think i just wanted to do what my teachers thought was best for me if yeah. that makes sense yeah. especially as a kid like i've gotten much better about standing up for myself uh <laughs> as an adult fortunately uh you kind of have to um but as a kid, I think I was very much, well, obviously they know better than I do. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just going to go along with whatever they say. And, you know, as you, if you can, can, now there was a point, I should say, where things got difficult. It was probably around that age you're talking about of like, you know, 13, 14, when you're getting into the upper, maybe early advanced stages, you know, of the repertoire. And it was like, oh, I have to practice more now. I thought, I wouldn't have to practice as much the better I got, but it's actually the opposite. <laughs> right. And, and I don't like practicing. It's kind of hard work. Uh, and I'm, you know, 14 and want to do other stuff, play video games. Um, <laughs> so I, there was resistance there that I had to kind of push through and I wanted to quit. And my parents were like, we'll just stick it out through this amount of time, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course, by pushing me along a little bit, I got through that, uh, sort of obstacle. And uh, at some point, I started to realize that, you know, even if I hadn't realized it at the time, um, all of those things that I was learning and in, in learning that repertoire that they wanted me to learn, like it built so much technique and so much ability um, that it's like, oh, there's a reason why they teach this stuff. It's not just because everyone else had to learn it. Maybe for some teachers, they approach it that way because I had to learn it, you have to learn it. Mm -hmm. But at, mm -hmm. at its core, it's like that, that rep will really teach you a lot and it will develop your technique in a way that maybe just doing whatever you want doesn't, you know, because we don't yeah. want to do hard stuff, you know? Yeah. So, so there is a certain amount of pushing through that, that I think is really beneficial if you can get to the other side of it and, and kind I think of see things from the bigger picture. This goes for me for any age. Uh, people who mm -hmm. are watching this who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, there is no time when you have to say, well, I'm too old for piano lessons now, or I'm yeah. too old to start learn uh, to go back and finish my bachelor's or finish my master's. I finished my master's three years ago. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. So, did you come right out of school and go right into college? Yeah, I went a year early, actually. I was homeschooled all the way through, mm -hmm. um, which maybe that's another discussion that we could have. Taught me a lot of things, too, um, that have helped me. But yeah, I was homeschooled all the way through, so I finished early, a year early. And my high school piano teacher really wanted me to go ahead and kind of go to the next level because she felt like, I'm not sure this was the case, but she felt like she had taught me <laughs> everything she could. Right. And um uh, so I did that and it was a good experience. And so, and I went straight through, uh, and got my master's. Where did you go through. to for your bachelor's? Uh, university of Southern Mississippi. Okay. Famous home of Brett Favre, All right. which we That's try right. not to talk about too much. <laughs> <laughs> and where is, uh, where'd you go for master's? Same, same place. Same. Okay. I, I nearly went to Alabama because they had one of the only organ, really big oh. organ programs at the time. Yeah. But I ended up staying around because um, my composition teacher was at USM, and uh, it was we can. That's another discussion. But we, yeah, but did he, the composition did uh, did the school have a composition masters or was just a general? No, he was there as composer in residence, and he taught a few things. He was 
semi-retired by the time I got there, but he took me on as a kind of a private student. So right. I, it was just an elective for me all the way through, but probably the single most important experience musically that I've ever had was being able to study with him during that time really shaped like my philosophies and, and a lot of the things that I still talk about and have built the YouTube channel on to this day. So what was your plan coming out of college? You had a, you had a bachelor's and a master's and probably in your mind through the whole time you're going to college for music and studying music there, you had an idea of what you're going to do for income. What was that? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Because I told my because... wife when I was doing my master's, it would be to teach. And now I'm teaching. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> maybe yeah. I just would rather compose. And that's and that's the funny thing. Both of my degrees are, are performance degrees because I didn't really want to teach. Yeah. I thought yeah. maybe, well, maybe, you know, if I go on and get my doctorate, I'll teach at the college level at some point. Because all I saw and all that I really knew that existed was just the path that all my professors had taken. So it's right. like you go and you get the degrees and then you teach other people how to get their degrees. You exactly. Know? Um, <laughs> and I, I always knew I didn't really want to do that. Like yeah. it felt like that just wasn't what I was supposed to do. So basically all that I knew was that I didn't want to teach like high school or, or anything like that. I, if I did any teaching, it would be like higher ed, yeah. I thought. Same. And then at some point, probably... Well, I think it was probably after I started studying composition, I was like, oh, this, this, I think is the thing. Because I always kind of viewed composers as like mythical beings, you know, it's like, how did they, it's like performance is fine, you know, but I feel like anyone with the, the talent and the the work ethic to see that talent through and develop those skills could could kind of do that. It's like a composer, like I had like this holy grail, you know, had them <laughs> up on the pedestal. I was always interested in, in composition and then with him kind of giving me the focus that I needed of uh, showing me the power of limitations and things like that, that I actually, yeah. that I talk about on the channel all yeah, the time. You do. Um, and it's true that, that really focused things. And I was like, okay, I, we may be onto something here. And at, from there, I, you know, I was also uh, kind of interested in, in electronics and things like that. Didn't know a lot about it at the time. And it was all looked down upon in the classical world. So I didn't explore it too much while I was in school, but I kind of wanted to get into film scoring. And I was like, well, how does one make music in a DAW? First of all, what's a DAW? <laughs> um, because I was writing everything, like everything that I wrote up until that point was like to be performed. It was art, art music, you know, with a capital yeah, series and finale or something at that point, probably. Yeah. Well, uh, I actually wrote everything by hand and then would, yeah. would put it into Sibelius, you Sibelius, know, or finale. Yeah. So yeah, it was all like for, for chamber groups at, at the school that I went to or for myself to play, you know, things like that. Or choirs. I, I sang in, in the, the choirs, uh, as I was coming through as well. Yeah. It, and that, that experience of writing for all of those things really helped me be able to write in a way that was not dependent upon the sounds I was using, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of electronic music is, uh, it's all kind of all texture, but also like I, I knew that I wanted, like that was fascinating to me that the sound design aspects and the, the texture, I would listen to things and be like, how are they doing this? Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea, you know? So, it seemed like the people who were doing that the most, like marrying those two worlds, were, were film composers. Gotcha. I just didn't know about all of the, the solo artists because I wasn't in that world who were also doing interesting things at the time. Cool. So that was kind of my plan. I was ready to move to L.A. Um, and I was like, well, I have this organ, the, these organ skills, too, which you, you have a bit more possibilities of getting jobs, mm -hmm. so, you know, steady jobs, because you can work, you do the church work thing. Um, as an organist, uh, we're a little less common than pianist. So, yeah. um, so that was kind of my backup and I was like, well, I'll do that until, you know, I don't know what I thought was going to happen. I would move to LA. Someone would discover me in a coffee shop, of course, even though I didn't drink coffee as we talked about <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it would just, you know, go, go on from there. But yeah, obviously didn't quite work out that way, but I did, that did kind of put me on the path of like, okay, how do you make music in a computer? 
and how can I kind of apply the stuff I already know to this kind of new world of, of synthesis and sound design and the electronic stuff. What are your thoughts about master's doctorate and that, that thing for those of the, for the few people watching this who might be thinking about that kind of thing? Well, um, first off, I do not regret one second that I spent earning those degrees. Same. However, in terms of it directly impacting what I do now, in terms of the credential itself, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like it, it has no bearing on what I do now, other than the experiences that I gained while earning those degrees, you know, which was very important. So, unless you decided you had this Jones to go teach at a four year yeah. school and become a professor, an organist, uh, chief in residence at a, college Correct. or something like that then it would yeah totally lot. and then, then it then it it does matter mm -hmm. but just in terms of what i'm doing right now and, and focusing on a youtube channel and an independent artist side mm -hmm. um you know obviously anybody can do that right sure and and lots of people do that have no uh music background at all even right and no formal education at all and that's that's fine but so what i what i tell people because i get this question a lot from people maybe younger people who are you know, just finishing high school and wondering what to do, like they're interested in music. So they ask like, well, do I really need, you know, to go to college or go to music school? And it's of course a case by case basis. And it depends a lot on whether or not you have to go into debt to do it, which mm -hmm. I don't think is a great idea. But what I tell them is um, the piece of paper itself is, is not as important as the experiences that you can gain. So it's a little hard for me to just say, you know, I didn't need to go to college at all. I can't say that because it has definitely informed everything I've done since. And I have no doubt that kind of the weird uh, blue ocean, if you want to call it, uh, that has helped my YouTube channel grow is the combination of that more traditional formal background with trying to explore some of these newer areas. And you just never know how how your unique combination of experiences will will form. <laughs> like we have no idea what our final form will be, right? Because it, for example, even with the YouTube channel, I really thought last year when I started making videos about that very topic, that what I would be doing is helping um, other classical composers and people who are classically trained get into electronic music. You right? thought you'd be doing like, one thing. And and what happened was actually the opposite <laughs> yeah. happened. It's like a lot of electronic people who had no music background, really, they had just started experimenting in a DAW with electronic mm -hmm. music. They were like, oh, well, you actually just put things that I thought were really complex in a way that I could understand it, you know, and, and was seemed useful you know, and not unobtainable, like, like, I think the colleges like to pretend to be like, you know, there's a certain status that they, they like to present mm -hmm. and, and, and barrier uh, that they like to keep up. But it's like, well, no, there are just certain concepts that just work. And so it's ended up kind of the inverse of what I thought has ended up being my bigger audience. So you just never know what's going to happen. You just learn as much as you can. And if, if college and degrees are a part of that, that you can do without putting yourself in such a financial hole, because I do think that's an important thing yeah. to say, mm -hmm. um, because I think it's all, it's near criminal <laughs> kind of what happens with student loans in this country yeah. in particular. It's never too late to do that in your life. In other words, go yeah. when you are hungry, you can pay for it yourself. You can go part-time and, mm -hmm. and, and go to school. You, there's lots of other kinds of degrees you can get besides a, a four year. There's two year things. There's uh, where I teach is a, like a technical school. It's kind of like a mini full sale type of school, not as mm -hmm. expensive. And you know you can get training in a lot of ways. You can get training from you. You can get training from me. You can get training from yeah. YouTube now. So there's a lot yep. of different ways to learn, not just a four year school. But if you are going to do that whole thing and you see the importance and you just decide, I do care about how history was made in music and I want to know all mm -hmm. that stuff. And so if you feel that way, then, then, and you just have a desire, burning desire to get knowledge, then go. If you don't, 
then there's other lots of other music experiences you can do in your life as a musician and different things that you can learn that are different than college. It's more experiment, yeah. experiential type of things. Yeah, that very well said. And you're a prime example of um, That's exactly sometimes it's I mean. beneficial to take a step back and figure out what you actually want before you just dive in. And that's why I caution against, you know, kids, essentially. I'm old enough now I can call 18 year olds kids. That's kind of <laughs> scary. But, you know, kids who are going into the red and they're not even sure, like, why? Yeah. That's that's a shame. Um, yeah. And and I think we need more people like you that that are examples and telling people that it's okay to to pump the brakes yeah. and just experiment with things for a while. If you don't really know going in, that's a great, great advice. I believe in college. I believe in higher learning mm -hmm. and more learning. I believe in learning all yeah. your life. I'm not done. I'm not done yeah. learning. I, I'm, I, I don't know if I'll go back to organized like school, things like that, but I'm going to be doing some more study and different things like that. So a lot of people think about, I mean, these, we're talking about two things that, Many people watching our channels never do. They never went to college, and they never deal with church or music in church or know that mm -hmm. there is money to be made by working at church uh, as, yeah. a, as a music uh, director or an organist or a pianist or whatever. And uh, I'm going to get into a little bit more of that on my channel. Yeah. So I'm calling this section the church music confluence, but I'm also calling it how you met my mother or... Nathan, my mom, and the church organist, because uh, my mother was the organist at our church from before I was born until about, for about 40 plus years, she was the church organist at our big Baptist church in Lexington, Kentucky, where I'm from. So I've been at church every day since, you know, when, when mm -hmm. I was a kid because she was the church organist, and, and that was what our family did. We just went to church because we had to, because she was going, right. and uh, and we lived there, and she was paid for forty years as the church organist. It mm -hmm. wasn't her main income, but it was a continual something she could count on. She was a traditionally trained player. Um, what was your path into being a church organist? Well, kind of similar. I grew up in church, um, and my dad was always the director, you know, because you know. Both my parents were musicians, as I mentioned earlier, and so they were both involved, you know, with mm -hmm. the church music. And that was actually some of my very first performance experiences were in my kind of small hometown church. Um, I remember them very vividly because I was absolutely terrified. Um, so, so that's where it started, and I always like. Like you, you mentioned that people just don't know, and it's like, well, I never knew anything else. You know, it's that, it's Same. that kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, so it never, it never, it always seemed like it's something that would be there. You know. Yeah. And then when I, uh, when I got interested in the organ, obviously that was a natural sort of progression. Um, and I remember very specifically, I was trying to figure out like whether to focus on piano or organ, and like whether to go off and study organ somewhere. But I also had a really good private organ teacher that I was mm -hmm. studying with, who was actually the organist at the church where I am now. Yeah. Um, and he was he was absolutely world-class uh, player. It kind of just worked out for me. I, I realize I'm very fortunate that I had a world-class organ instructor and composition instructor like in my home area. So it just kind of kind of fell into place. One of my piano professors said, you know, I know a lot of pianists, and I know a lot of organists, and the pianists are all looking for the same few jobs, and the organists all have jobs. Yeah, yeah. Because there just aren't as many, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so I kind of took that to heart, and I was like, well, I, you know, even though I'm majoring in piano and focusing on that, I'm st I'm going to keep the organ side up as if I were also majoring in that. So I really had to, you know, applied instruments effectively. Mm -hmm. So, and it worked out that way. My teacher left, he moved to Texas to take another bigger job. And uh, I had filled in at that church several times and took lessons there. So it kind of was a natural thing. They knew me a little bit, I knew them and, uh, and it worked out. And that happened about the time I was, I was looking to, to move to LA. And then I got this, this good steady job yeah. and met my wife around that same time. So I didn't move to LA and that's the best thing that, <laughs> that could have happened for me is just to stay here in the middle of nowhere yeah. and just focus on kind of, you know, my own music. So are, are you um, still at that same church? I am. Wow. Yep. 
Yep, coming up on nine years now. So yeah, it's Why been, you... and it's exactly like you said. It's a good, like no one's ever going to get rich becoming a church organist sure. or a director of music. Maybe at like a mega church or something, but that's another <laughs> that's another animal. Um, but it is steady, um, and I don't have office hours per se. Like as long as I learn all the music and have everything prepared for the choir, then I get to work on my own projects you know, when I want to, which has been really good. So it is a lot of work. It's a lot of preparation, but it's not fixed time work, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. So that's been really, really helpful uh, in allowing me to build all this other stuff on the side. Why, why do you think people discount church work? Is it just because they don't know or they, they just... They figure everybody's volunteering their time, or, or <laughs> what? Why do you I, think it's not maybe, a... maybe? And that was certainly the case at like the the smaller church that I grew up in. It was all volunteer, you mm -hmm. know, for the most part. But you know, when you get into a little bit bigger of a church, and like my church is very traditional. Obviously, it's all like there is no instrument in there other than the organ. Oh, really? And I lead everything no piano? from the from the organ. No piano. Okay. Um, what denomination? There is a piano. There is, it's Presbyterian. Okay. There is a piano in there, but we don't use it during the service. It's all like, I lead the choir from the organ. Everything is organ. And no it's contemporary very like, worship. No, no. Okay. I'm playing Good. Bach and like books to Huda and, um, <laughs> you know, Franck and stuff like that every, every Sunday. So I'm kind of like, sounds lovely. That, and that's why it's a lot of work because that music is hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but it's also really musically rich uh, sure. and I stay. I stay connected with that kind of music in a way that I wouldn't otherwise if I didn't have to do that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't, it's not something that maybe I want to do forever, okay. but it is, something that I, that. it is something that I, I know I can always go back to you know, if I miss it um, right. down the road. So as other things are picking up steam, I'm, I'm to that point now where I'm wondering, you know, is it time to scale back uh, in that area? and, and go all in as it were. You can probably relate to when you do something like that at that level for that long, it becomes part of your identity in such yeah. a way. No. Well, there's a second so. part for you and I, because most of my clients are in the Christian or gospel space. Mm -hmm. And your job is also at the church. And there's this feeling and people who don't are involved in this don't know, is that you are walking away from God or you are letting <laughs> yeah. God down who gave you this talent and you're thinking, oh, I should still do these yeah. things because they help, they glorify him or whatever you want to say. They are God things. And and if I walk away, what, what does that say about me that I'm just leaving this so I can be a YouTube star or whatever? Ungrateful, ungrateful <laughs> yeah. little, yeah. Right, yeah. and and I'm, I am I using my talents correctly and effectively and and yeah. uh, in the right purpose? And a lot of people don't wouldn't understand that because if you're not from that thing, so there's that whole side of things. But there is something else happening, and let's move on into the YouTube phenomena that is uh, Jameson Nathan Jones <laughs> channel. Uh, when did the channel become a thing? I mean, how did it start? Did was it just a fun little side thing? Well, or? the channel actually started when I started my artist career. So about eight years ago, or seven, eight years ago, something like that. I don't know. You can go back and look at the exact date, probably. I was like, well, I'll just put all the, the music that I'm making there. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, as I got into synthesizers, it's like, well, I'll just put all of the like hardware synthesizer jams, quote unquote, <laughs> as they're called, um, there, right? And, you know, that got no views. So... <laughs> Um, so for years, you know, years and years and years, um, it was just a place to park. Like if I would make a music video or something like that was just where I would just sure. I would throw it up there. I guess it was late, like really late 2021. I started to get kind of down about where I, I was as an artist. Like my reality was not meeting my expectations, which that is partly an expectation problem on my part, which is a whole other subject. But I thought I would be further than I was at that point. I had had just enough success in streaming early on that I, it, it set that as like, okay, this is the baseline. It's just going to go up from here. And it didn't go up from there. It, it went 
as everything does, it was not linear, right? Yeah. It went down for a while and I would get really upset, you know, at that, even though I had no control over it. And then it would come back up and then it would go back down again. And I was like, well, this, I, I don't, I, at some point I realized it's like, well, I'm, I'm just banking on getting lucky at this point. It feels like, so it's like, what can I do that feels more proactive and feels more like I have some control over what I'm getting out of it. And like everybody says that YouTube is great for that, right? <laughs> I wish I had a more philosophical answer for you for why I started <laughs> getting more serious, but it's like, you know, well, everybody says that a YouTube channel is the way to go. So I did that. And the only thing I knew, because the only thing I was really watching at that point was like synthesizer stuff, because I was really into the gear side of things. So I was like, Hey, I know some stuff about synthesizers now. I'll just do that. I'll do synth demos and just show how I use the stuff I'm using already. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's how it started. And between 2021, like the very end of 2021, uh, for the next year or so, I went from the couple thousand subscribers I had <laughs> managed to amass over many years of just putting music there. I got up to just under 10,000 subscribers. I was like, okay, well, this is moving in a direction and I'm seeing output based on the inputs that I've sure. been putting in. Yeah. So that's, that's cool. where I am right that's now. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good feeling. So around that time, the channel was getting big enough that, you know, the people who make gear start coming around and being like, mm -hmm. oh, this guy's getting some views and he's reviewing gear. Mm -hmm. Well, we should get him to review our gear. And that is really exciting for about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you realize, well, now I'm just making, I'm just the marketing team for this yeah. company, yeah. you know, and they're, they're willing to give me some stuff, but I can't actually eat yeah. guitar pedals or right. synthesizers. And I'm really making no money off of that at all. So, and, and nobody realizes how much time it takes to make all of oh these videos. Gosh. Well, and that's one reason that I put off for years and years actually trying on YouTube because I knew I knew just enough about editing, not much, but just enough to know that I didn't know much and it was hard. So at some point last year, yeah. 2023, last spring was when things kind of really took off. Comparatively speaking, it's not like I've had videos go super viral or anything, but last spring I made just this tiny shift. I wanted to explore studying or talking about some of the stuff that I had studied, you know, mm -hmm. like composition yeah. and, and how I incorporate that, you know, all the stuff that I was just doing intuitively and taking for granted that I, but it's like, well, nobody wants to hear that because, you know, I, I know how I do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> when I started shifting towards that, I put out one video, the very, I got kind of lucky. The very first video that I put out, um, I think it was called how music technology almost ruined my music because, you know, and the premise being that I got so into the sound that I almost forgot all of those other things that I knew of like how to make melodies interesting. Yeah. And, right. And maybe a, a deeper, more rich harmonic language mm -hmm. that video took off and it, it shocked me how it took off for me, that was a viral video. Mm -hmm. You know, we went from getting maybe a few thousand to a hundred thousand on that wow. video. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. It seems like I've struck a nerve that relates to other people here. Yeah. And from that point on, I've really shifted from focusing on the gear so much, which I really think is one of the least interesting things to talk about anyway, <laughs> to like how I use, the gear and how I actually, what are my philosophies about making music Yeah. and how do I use all that stuff to make music? Because, and, and that's the most important thing still. That's why I said early on that, that it's important to me that I stay focused on making the music I want to make and that everything revolves around that, because I think that's the only way it can sustain. Because like, even if I have a, a dip, you know, where the, the videos don't do as well, I'm still just making the stuff I would make anyway and just figuring out ways to tell stories about it that yeah. can relate and teach people like one or two simple things that might help them. And that shift, like, I can't explain what it's done for the channel um, and what it's done for me personally, 
Um, and future, it, been, what, you're, what it's done for likely your future as, yeah. as how you make music, how you make music income and all those things probably, because it is for me, it's happening. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 been really great to see and it's so much more fulfilling when you make a video like that about stuff that you really are interested in telling people and it, and it gets a good response, you know, like that. It, it shows you that there's a, a hunger for that sort of thing. So how did it, how did it change the channel? Has it changed your composition? Has it changed your, uh, or, or, or maybe, um, uh, augmented it in some way, your composition? Yeah, I think so. Um, now that you mentioned, now that you put it that way, um, because I'm actually, it's it's like a snowball, yeah, uh, or like a cyclical thing where like I talk about this stuff, and this is something that you know. There's a group of people that that are always will comment, will just shut up and just make music, and what they don't realize is that by thinking about these things and talking about them, you know, as a teacher. If you are going to talk about something, you have to actually know what you're talking about. So I have to think these things through. And my videos have become like essays at this point mm -hmm. where I'm like, I'm writing the essay and I'm actually having to go back and refine and be like, well, really, no, that's not how I approach this or that. And then I, I've also reminded myself of a lot of things um, that I knew years ago, you know, and, and was uh, implementing in my compositional work that I sort of forgot about. And, and so it's kind of, in talking about it, it has helped me actually do the stuff that I talk about. And I think they have, they feed each other. You have mm -hmm. to, you have to be a, I think you have to still do to teach the, you know, we have the whole, yes. uh, those who can't teach, those who can't comma, teach but i think the really effective teachers are the ones who are doing as they are teaching you know what i mean they're they're exactly. doing at the same time they're teaching and then they're teaching yep. off current what's happening currently that's the only way you're going to help people currently work mm -hmm. is teach them about what things are happening currently so how do you stay motivated to continue to teach? I mean, with me, one thing feeds the other because I make a, mm -hmm. I, I go put a, this classical album on CD Baby trying to get it in these certain stores. And then I'm thinking, this is going to make a great video <laughs> if I talk about yep. all the yep. things I'm screen grabbing as I'm doing because I'm thinking, oh, people need to know that you got to put a period right here. Somebody needs to be telling people this because if people are going to do this. So how, how does it help you? be motivated do things feed each other yeah that's that's very well put like it is a cyclical thing um where i am thinking now about the videos when i make music and vice versa mm -hmm. um and it's not but it's not in a way like i think when you say that to certain people they're like well you sold out right mm -hmm. like in some way you can't do two things <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's no longer art if you're doing two things. Oh, I'll fight people um, to the ground about that. There's there's no way that I can go teach and stand in front of 18 to 35-year-olds at the school I teach. There's nothing more powerful than telling them about an artist interaction from the day before or be talking and a PayPal payment comes in. I'm trying to teach them how to live a music life and make, because they want to make income when they leave yeah. this school and they want to get gigs producing or they want to do live gigs. And I'm like, I just did this thing last night and here's what it made me. To yeah. me, yeah. Uh, you have to do both because they both feed each other and there's no stronger teaching than that, I don't think. Well, and if you can figure out a way uh, which I think you're good at, at, at just doing the things you would do anyway and, and teaching about that, then it almost takes the pressure off of your work, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Like if you have multiple ways to make an income off of that work, like for instance, uh, I think we mentioned early on that my music doesn't always fit perfectly into a playlist, right? <laughs> So, so, so what do, and I think a lot of artists fall into this category. It's like, well, I don't want to make, you know, what is going to be easily playlistable. So how do I get people to listen to it? And how do I make a living from it? Well, you have to find some other avenue, some other way to make money and to get attention that is not the music itself, mm -hmm. but it is the music itself. It's just indirect. 
right? You're not getting it from Spotify, which it takes an incredible, like people don't realize people are so focused on trying to get their streaming numbers up Mm -hmm. that they don't realize just how many streams it takes to actually live off of streaming. Yeah. It's an insane number. But if you can have this other thing, like say you're, if, if you can figure out a way to teach people and enough people are interested in what you're doing, then that takes the pressure off of your art and you don't yeah. have to sell the art. You can sell your knowledge, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's been a, to me, that makes, that frees up the art to be yeah. more art <laughs> yeah. uh, because it's not the direct product itself. It's yeah. your knowledge about it. It's your teaching. Um, and I'm starting to talk about that in some videos too. And I know I'm going to get killed by a certain number of people, but I don't really care about those people anyway. And I have such respect for what you're doing because you're very transparent about that. And I think it's great because you do have to address the need we all have to eat three times a day and Mm -hmm. have a place to sleep where, you know, we don't get rained on. Okay. Let's switch over and just real quickly talk about music licensing. Because the hypothesis is that music licensing is free money. All you have to do is put your music out there, find people who need music for TV or film or whatever, and uh, or you know find a site that'll take your music and sell it for you. You don't even have to do anything. And uh, you know I have been when I discovered music licensing, I was in the midst of my production career and I thought this sounds much more fun making the music I want to make and putting it into things I want to make. So I I shifted gears. What part of your time is spent on music licensing and what's your history with it? That's two different questions, but well, the, the part of my time that is spent on it now is different than it has been and that I'm not really doing any, um, Like what I would, and Dave and I talked about this as well, you know, the artisan work, Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that anymore because, and I did, I did do it for about a year. And this was the year before I started the YouTube channel. I was like, okay, well, I'll do this. When you say the artisan, you mean the person who does stuff for money specifically. You're sent a brief, you write to that brief. They say, we need it to sound like this. You make it sound like that, right? So um, you're you're writing tailor-made music for this thing, and it has to be very specific. And it is not about what you want to do as an artist; uh, it's about what the the director wants. I don't know if I can say this online, but briefs chafe me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a it's been a long time since I've worn any. <laughs> I do not like I do not like briefs um yeah <laughs> this is a that's this actually is a, why I got that's why I got out of sync licensing because they told me I would have to do briefs and I was like I don't I, I don't want to do that it feels too restrictive for me as an artist <laughs> that's a it's a great term because it does briefs do restrict me and and I think that uh I I have really learned to dislike briefs like for instance I got a brief in and I did a thing to it that I really liked and I sent it to my library and they said, it's fine. Now can you make it more hip hoppy? Which mm. by the way, that should show you I can't because I just said the word hip hoppy. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, so anyway, back to where you are with music licensing. Yeah, so I, I did all that and you know I had a little bit of an artist career at that point. So they kind of knew the style that I enjoyed writing in. It was a music licensing house. They would send, they were the third party, basically. They would send me the brief and connect me to the to the, gotcha. the ad agency or whoever, mm-hmm. which I didn't really understand how that worked. I didn't understand that they were sending it to like 10 different composers and we were all competing for the same yes, little scraps, you know? Or, or 100 different. Comp- and yeah. they are sending yeah. the same brief that some, like probably dozens mm-hmm. of other libraries are sending to all of their writers to yep. compete with. And oh, that's, yeah. and, that's and, and there is, there's that's a possibility. sending your demo of, tape off to LA all over again, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I mean, you feel like you have a good chance because it's like, oh, they've connected me to the, but actually it's, there's a very real possibility, <laughs> a very good chance that your work won't be chosen. Right. And in this case, I wasn't compensated for just doing 
the brief, you know. Right, right. So there was a very real zero sum possibility, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I, within a year, and also people don't realize like how much work that is in, in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Like they may email you at nine o'clock at night and be like, we need this by morning. And I didn't want to live my life that way. So I was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, and th at that point I started focusing on YouTube more, but anyway, uh, so that was my experience with like, you know, having an intermediary, um, who was working with all of these ad agencies and trailer houses and all that kind of stuff. I didn't like it. Um, and it's fine for people who love it. I know people who make a good living off of it, but it yeah. just wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, so the other, the other approach is just whatever I'm making anyway, the stuff that I want to make, finding places to park that, um, where people come to look for music for their videos or, or whatever, you know, and I've used, you know, several non-exclusive libraries like Artlist and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, you know, I make, I may get, you know, several thousand a year, depending on the year and what I've put into the, to the library, uh, that year. Um, so it's not unsubstantial, but it's not, you know, what I'm paying all my bills with either. It's kind right. of, I kind of look at it as a bonus, you know? I'm in the same boat as you. I'm in that place where yeah. it's hard for me to write to briefs because it feels too much like work. Yeah. So. Well, and that's, that was the thing that I was finding. It's like, I have no time to work on my own music. I wasn't yeah. releasing as much music. And that's what makes it different with YouTube. It's like, if, because it's all, yes, it, it is a lot of work to run a YouTube channel and put out a video every week or every two weeks, but it's all centered around my music, like the stuff that I want to make anyway. So, you know, it's like you said, it kind of gives me a reason to do both things and to keep that wheel turning yeah. <clears throat> that is much more closely related to what I want to be doing anyway. So that has, has been far better for me uh, from a, a mental health standpoint than, yeah. than churning out briefs at a alarming rate and seeing an alarming lack of money come in from that. So. When did you start to implement synthesizers into your work was it an offshoot of the organ? Do you think the organ and synthesizer kind of came about? How did synthesizers come into your life? Okay, we're, we're going to go way back to that diaper story that I told very oh early. That is early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I mentioned yes in, a, in an offhanded way. My dad loved those progressive rock bands. Yes was his favorite and became my favorite, therefore, by default. Right. Um, so I loved Rick Wakeman. I loved Keith Emerson. Uh, I loved Rush. I, mm -hmm. I was listening to all these bands that were using synthesizers, you know, back then. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And these guys, they're keyboard players. They're not just pianists, you know. Um, they play all of these different instruments. And that was a, exactly what sparked my interest in the organ. It was like, I don't want to just be a pianist. You know, I want to be, I want to wear a cape and play rock music from the seventies, even though I, you know, it was not many people say the that 70s. these days. I want to wear a cape. I know. Well, you know, I do wear Except a robe uh, every Sunday when I play the organ. <laughs> so it true. kind of, it kind of worked out. I'm just saying it kind of all worked the way that I planned. Um, you should have a cape but, for the robe. That would be awesome. Oh, I know. Yeah. Like a double. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm into it. But anyway, yeah. So that was like, uh, my early impression of a rock star, you know, like, oh my gosh, these guys are awesome. They're mm -hmm. had this virtuosity and they play all these different keyboard instruments. Um, so then I went through and got all of these, um, you know, music degrees and kind of put that on the, the back shelf and looked down on it for a while because I was, I became very snobby as you have to, yes, to get through. Of course, classical you were music way more important than popular very, yeah. music. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so I kept all that a secret that I actually still liked that stuff. I tried to keep that under wraps. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then when I graduated and started to, you know, think about film scoring, um, that's when I really got back into it because I was like, well, what, you know, how is Hans Zimmer getting all these sounds and, you know, all this, all the stereotypical film composers that were doing things that were like hybrid orchestral and electronic. And uh, at some point along the line, um, I discovered uh, the modern classical scene where they were using 
the the more traditional um, instrumentation, along with all of these old analog synthesizers in in a very different way than Yes was using them. Are you talking <laughs> yeah. about Wendy Carlos or anything like that, or? Um... Uh, not specifically. I mean, I was aware of like the switched on Bach and everything. Yeah. Um, it, it really never interested me just to hear synthesizers playing classical music. You know, gotcha. I, yeah. I was more interested in like um, the stuff that they, that the synthesizers could do that other instruments couldn't, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, so, um, yeah, I got into that. Um, when I say modern classical, that's that's a genre term. It's like Oliver Arnold's and Nils Fromm and all of mm -hmm. these guys who are doing like minimalist, you know, electronic and acoustic stuff. So I found that blend of textures really interesting. And I was like, hmm, maybe I could kind of get into doing something like that. Um, and at that point, I started learning more about synthesizers, watching synth YouTube, which gave me the idea to do <laughs> those kind of videos later on. And, uh, you know, kind of got sucked down the rabbit hole of electronics and gear and synthesis and all that stuff. So that's when the obsession really sort of took hold was in that period after I had finished my degrees, um, before I really knew what I wanted to be doing, you know, I was just kind of exploring, um, mm -hmm. like what was possible, how do people make these sounds? It was all curiosity at that point. I had no idea what I was doing, but, um, just kind of learned as I went along. And so it just made sense for you to start to integrate them into the channel. Was that a, was that because you were reviewing them and stuff like that? Or, or is it just that you had an interest in how to approach them and with composing? Yeah, well, both, you know, that's mostly what I was watching at the time because I had kind of learned how to use them through a combination of experimentation and YouTube, <laughs> you know, I was also experimenting with them in my own music like how mm -hmm. how can i use these things that do very specific things well and other things not so well in maybe unexpected ways and uh and so that's kind of what launched me wanting to show some of the techniques that i was using um and just show what i had learned about sound design you know up until that point because that was at that time, that was the most interesting thing that I could think of to talk about because that was what was fresh on mm -hmm. my mind. Like this mm -hmm. was the new thing. You know what I mean? Well, awesome, man. Well, this is, uh, I have so much more to ask you. So there's going to have to be a second interview because I want to talk we about can do keyboards. It. I want to talk about synths. I want to talk about your composing method. I mean, uh, but that's that's for another channel and another time. So yeah. uh, I, I just find what you are doing fascinating. You are a... Um, uh, hero is probably a little far, but you are a inspiration to a lot of us who are just, you know, be who you are, do your thing, and then show people how you are doing your thing and teach from that. Mm. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And I just really appreciate that, that about your channel. One of the things that it's like there's these other guys I watch who do who talk about how to put your music on Spotify and run ads and stuff like Andrew Southworth and people like that. Mm -hmm. And it's because they make their own music and put it out. And and right. I, they're doing what they're teaching about and saying, here yeah. are my stats after I spent this much. I love that. And I love people mm -hmm. who are doing the thing and then teaching the thing. So I appreciate what you're doing with that. And uh just a fan and think you're hilarious and uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime. Oh, thanks so much, Eric. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. Anytime you want to do it again, just let me know. Cool. Next week, um, about this time. <laughs> anyway, no, we'll, we'll wait Perfect. a little bit. Make it a weekly thing. <laughs>